Good morning, church. It's always one of my favorite songs in the world is to hear those that I love so much on this planet singing the praises of our great God and King together. Thank you for those who have led us thus far in doing so. We look forward to joining our voices again together uh, later in our service as we continue in worship. I got an email this week that was rather unusual. A parental advisory warning from our kids' ministry director, Jen. As our kids have gone downstairs and continue to work through the biggest story curriculum, they deemed the video that they were about to show most of the kids unsuitable for all viewers. The youngest group downstairs is actually going to be dismissed to their own classroom before it is watched by the rest of them. What could they possibly be learning that would make this necessary? They're learning the tragic history of the first instance of what we'll be learning the Sixth Commandment prohibits. They're going to be taught of the violent decline of humanity's plunge into sin. They're going to be learning about the first murder or the first instance when one image bearer used the hands that God gave him to murder his brother. Hands that were given to be used for the glory of God and the love of God. Hands that were given for the good and love of others, but hands that were instead employed to unilaterally destroy a fellow image bearer that God had created. We wish we did not have to teach the children such history, especially when the wrongness of Cain's killing of Abel seems so obvious to them. Interestingly, the obviousness of the wrongness of murder does not ever seem to leave us as we grow. In fact, of the Ten Commandments, writes one author, I quote, just about the only commandment everyone still seems to accept is number six. No one approves of murder. It is so contrary to the law of nature that every culture has some sort of prohibition against it. In one sense, that's an accurate statement. In our own country, we certainly have prohibitions against murder, but in another sense, it's not an accurate statement. Murder is approved under different names, under different definitions. And under those names and definitions, it's not just approved, but it's celebrated, it's justified, it's defended. What society believes are acts of love and mercy, in God's eyes, are anything but. And into this cultural milieu, there needs to be a recovery of both the truth of God and the fear of God. The truth of how I'm summarizing the meaning of the sixth commandment this morning is this unauthorized destruction of God's image bearers is always prohibited. There is never, ever an instance when we get to sit in God's throne and decide who dies. Unauthorized destruction of God's image bearers is always prohibited. We need to recover the truth of that in our country. The dearth of this truth and the fear of God it should generate will continue to result in the death of many. The recovery of both will result in the saving of many, and most of all, when the truth is told and the Spirit convicts, our hope and prayer ought to be for the salvation of many lives through the good news of the gospel. Ultimately, this is what we need, because the problem is not only with human hands. The problem is with human hearts. How else are we to explain the obvious contradiction? What contradiction, you ask? The contradiction between how easily the little ones downstairs and we, along with them, will conclude that murder is wrong 
and yet how many times the sin is actually committed. One, according to Jesus, that is committed in thought and word long before it is committed in deed, which implicates every single one of us. And I realize that I may have perhaps sucked all the oxygen out of the room this morning. And this is weighing and sitting heavy. And it should. And it will. But as we turn again to God's word this morning, my hope and my prayer is that against this backdrop of the ugliness and the evil of sin, that the beauty and light of the gospel will shine all the clearer. So turn with me to Exodus 20, verse 13, to see the case against us, which will drive us to the only one who can save us from ourselves, the Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 20. We are on the sixth commandment this morning as we take them one at a time. It's verse 13. But I'm going to pray and then read from the beginning so we hear it all in context each week. Would you bow with me? Let's pray. Lord, as we sang the song we did just before continuing in this portion of our service, I was daunted, as I am every week, to look out and see men and women and young men and women and high school students and grade school students. There's a lot of souls in this room, Lord, and they need to hear your word. And that's not something that I can cause to happen. I'm daunted to handle your word publicly, for it is yours. And so pray, Lord, that you would help me to do it by the power of your spirit, so that it would go forth. And as seed is scattered and seed is watered, oh, would it please you this morning to give growth for your and to your glory alone. So help your word to be preached, help it to be heard, and help it to be obeyed, especially in that first call that every single person is responsible to obey, which is to repent and believe the gospel, to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May that be true for anyone here this morning who has not yet done so, and this for your honor. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask, and God's people say, Amen. Exodus 20, beginning at verse 1, we'll stop at verse 13. This is what the Word of God says. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, by showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh, your God, in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that Yahweh your God has given you. In verse 13, you shall not murder. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning we bring a high-powered zoom lens to our study of Scripture. Quite literally, Exodus 20, 13 is two words in the original Hebrew, as is the seventh command, as is the eighth command. And for those of you who may be interested in these types of things, fun fact, 
these would have all easily stuck in the memory and rolled off the tongue of the ancient Hebrew. All the commandments from here on out begin with the same letters, which if I was to loosely put into English would sound something like, never slaughter, never sleep around, never steal, never slander, never secretly long. They're each stated negatively, which we could render you must not or you cannot. And these were prohibitions for God's covenant people that govern their treatment of one another as they live together as God's people. And as we zero in, we do well to bear this in mind. So with each commandment, expect to be reminded of the big picture of Exodus, which relates to the bigger picture of the greater Exodus that Jesus Christ has led. Back when we started our series in Exodus, we said that this is the theater of God's glory, where Yahweh positions his covenant people in Egypt to reveal his identity. He takes them down into Egypt. He blesses them numerically. Then he brings them out as a nation, setting the stage for the whole world to know that Yahweh is God. In Exodus, Yahweh redeems his people by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. That's chapters 1 through 18. He makes them a kingdom of priests through covenant. That's chapters 19 through 24. And then he prepares them for his glorious presence. That's chapters 25 through 40. And in the greater Exodus, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord does the same thing. He redeems a people. He makes them a kingdom of priests. He prepares them for his glorious presence. The Apostle Peter puts it this way, but you, writing to the church, Gentile, Jew, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And just as God's old covenant people were called to live in such a way to, after their rescue to display his glory. So we as his new covenant people are called to live a certain way after our rescue to display his glory. And as we continue through the Ten Commandments, we will discover a great deal of consistency, of parallel between this law covenant, which is no longer binding on us as law covenant, and the law of love under Christ empowered by the Spirit. Love does no wrong to neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law, Paul writes in Romans chapter 13, verse 9, after quoting commandments 6 through 10, including you shall not murder. So we can say still today that unauthorized destruction of God's image bearers is prohibited. It always was in the Old Covenant. It's no less true in the New Covenant in our spirit-fueled fulfillment of the law of Christ. And the Sixth Commandment then provides wisdom and instruction and some shape for us on what we look to the Spirit to ultimately fulfill in our lives as those who are in Christ. And again, the purpose of which is to put on display the power of the gospel to the glory of God as a witness to a watching world. So let's bear that in mind as we zero in on Exodus 20, verse 13. And the place to begin our understanding of the meaning of the sixth commandment is with the meaning of the word, sometimes translated murder, sometimes translated kill. As one of our life groups uh, experienced this week, judging by the questions they sent me, much of our understanding here hinges on definitions. They asked, for example, is there a difference between murder and killing? What do we make of God's command to his people to wipe out the Canaanites? What do we make of God himself bringing death to multitudes of people in Egypt? What about killing in war? What about capital punishment? The footnote in the ESV, if you have one, includes carelessness or negligence. What does all of this encapsulate? Who knew two words could generate so many questions and so much discussion? Now, since we are only dealing with two words, we can afford a bit of a deep dive on the word murder, which will bring great clarity. Of the different terms used for killing or murder in the Old Testament, this one is never used of a person killing an animal. 
often which God commands in sacrifices and which he gives us authority over the animals to do. So, Pastor Sergei, keep smoking your meat and feeding it to us. The word in this verse is never used with respect to holy war commanded by God of his people. There are just wars. The word used here is never used for capital punishment commanded by God, such as in the Noahic covenant, and some would contend is uh, an exercise that the state is to carry out today based on Romans 13. The word used here in Exodus 20, 13 is never used for self-defense. Permitted, for instance, if a killing blow is delivered during a home invasion in the night, which the Old Testament law made provision for. That being said, helpfully then, we can rule out those as being prohibited by the commandment, none of which I'm going to deal with here, as there will be plenty of opportunity and occasion later when we start getting into the application of the law in Exodus 21 and 22 and so on. Now, where there is some confusion is that the word in Exodus 20, 13 is also used in the Old Testament in places of... uh, negligent homicide, accidental killing. For example, if you were to go home and read Numbers 35, there's this lengthy instruction on establishing cities of refuge for people to flee to in the event that they unintentionally cause the death of someone else. In a groaning creation, sadly, that sometimes happens. Out of love for neighbor, we are responsible to do all we can to avoid negligence that could lead to the death of another, which, again, we'll encounter later as we continue in Exodus. For now, based on how the word is used in the Old Testament and based on what we can rule out by how it is not used, we can begin to narrow in on what the commandment actually prohibits. I have some quotations to share here, which I found very helpful, and I'm passing along. I quote, The sixth commandment is perhaps best understood as stating, No human being may take a life without divine approval. Another puts it this way, The prohibition may be defined more narrowly as the taking of a life outside of the parameters laid down by God. Another, just filling out the understanding, the Hebrew term used here is specific to putting to death improperly for selfish reasons. If you were to bring that down to the individual level, again I quote, no Israelite acting on his own or her own could decide that he or she had the right to end someone's life. So, put generally, final quotation, the sixth word or commandment underlines the sanctity of human life and expresses a strong prohibition against actions and attitudes that might cause the death of anyone. Thus, I have summarized, unauthorized destruction of God's image bearers is always prohibited. And the phrase also touches on two reasons why this is prohibited in both the Old and in the New Covenant. The first of those is that life belongs to God. We learn in the first book of Moses in in Genesis and the second book of Moses uh, in Exodus that God is the sovereign creator, ruler, sustainer of all creation. This is his universe. It's not our universe. He is the author of life, not us. Someone writes, what the commandment establishes is an absolute divide between God and humans in the issue of killing. What the Decalogue, that's just the Ten Commandments, Ten Words, what that establishes is the difference in authority over life and death between us and God. The person continues, our task is not to try to supply a detailed list of types of killing that are and are not permitted, a list that the Decalogue somehow forgot to include. Instead, we are called to see that life is not ours to take, 
but belongs to God alone. And whenever we cross this threshold and human life is taken, we are acting in God's place. That's what we're saying. That's what we're communicating. And the only one who has authority and who can give us authority to act in his stead in this way is God himself. And if he has not given that to us, we dare not take that authority for ourselves. We have no right as an action of our hands to conclude, despite God creating a life and sustaining a life, to say, you know what? I don't think you should exist anymore. I think God is mistaken. I think it would be better if you were dead. So I'm going to climb up into God's throne in this instance and make the unilateral decision that the universe should not have you in it anymore. This is a horrendous, monstrous, evil, sinful, rebellious declaration that we have no right to make because life is God's. A second reason underlying this commandment is that people are made in God's image. That is to say, human beings have intrinsic, they have inherent value. Some of you might have been here to, to listen to Ewan Gallagher in the summertime. He writes, uh, his, his book is called, How Then Should We Die? And he illustrates this by comparing the value of a smartphone to a person. Your smartphone, if you have one, has extrinsic value. We value it only in as much as it works, as it is useful, as it is a tool for accomplishing specific purposes. But the moment that it breaks or we drop it in the toilet or the last latest iPhone comes out, its value diminishes in our eyes significantly. And no one really cares. It's just a phone. The value of the phone is external to the phone. A person, however, is entirely different. A person has value from the moment of conception and for all of life, regardless of ability or inability, because they were made by God and they were made in God's image. That's what the commandment is fundamentally recognizing, not just the, the creature-creator distinction that God is God and we are not, but the inherent worth of boys and girls and men and women because of who made them and because of what they are. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, God said. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And David is this, this beautiful poetry that we love so much, and we reflected in our singing earlier today, Psalm 139. He, he writes, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And there's a whole bunch of people now singing the camp song in their head. Uh, if you were serving in the summertime, that was one of the memory verses. And come and tell me afterwards if that was you. But David goes on to say, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. And what was true of the value of life as those made in the image of God, from the account of creation to the womb of every human being, remains true to the end of life also. Listen to this, reflected in Isaiah 46, verses 3 and 4, as God speaks to his covenant people. He says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he. And to gray hairs I will carry you, I have made and I will bear, I will carry and I will save. I share with you again one of my favorite scenes from C.S. Lewis's Prince Caspian, 
one of the books in the Chronicles of Narnia who just wonderfully and imaginatively captures all of this. It's the time when Aslan is telling Caspian the story of how his descendants came to be in Narnia. He says, many years ago, a shipload of pirates were driven by a storm on an island. And there they did as pirates would, killed the natives, took the native women for wives, made palm wine and drank and were drunk and lay in the shade of the palm trees and woke up and quarreled and sometimes killed one another. And from the island, from the island Aslan continues, they fell or rose or blundered or dropped right through a, a, a chink and they found themselves in the world of Narnia, in the land of Telmar, which was then unpeopled. And he says, their descendants, they became a fierce and a proud people. They invaded Narnia and they conquered it and they ruled it. And Caspian is not at all pleased to hear the story of his people, of his line. And in despair, he says to Aslan, I was wishing I came of a more honorable line. And I'll give Aslan's response in a moment, but the question I've asked before, I'll ask again. Does Caspian's lament strike a chord with you? Maybe you could look into the distant past and have the red of shame color your cheeks as you reflect on what you came from. Moving into the present, perhaps you would echo Caspian's sadness, not because of your ancestors, but because of your own actions. If we were to take a moment and display up here everyone's moral portrait, as you know it and as God knows it, I expect you would run from here and you would never want to show your face again. In fact, you may not even be able to look at it yourself without the burn of self-hatred rising up like bile in your throat. Sometimes such loathing can be triggered just by looking at ourselves in the mirror because of the way we hate, the way we look physically, or we compare ourselves to social media profiles of people who are more skilled, faster, smarter, younger, more accomplished, more beautiful, more handsome. The way we view ourselves is often affected because we've suffered at the words and hands of others who have drilled into us with evil hatred that we're worthless, that we're a mistake. And those voices can be so loud, they're difficult to tune out and even more difficult to reject. Whatever way Caspian's wishing might hit home for you, what we've read from Scripture is beautifully captured in Aslan's response to Caspian. He says to him, You come from the Lord Adam and the Lady Eve, and that is enough to lift the head of every poor beggar even the poorest. That is what the commandment assumes, that we are image bearers, that we are created by God, we are created for God, and therefore we are of inestimable, inherent value. So then to take God's place and unilaterally decide to kill what God has made is thus always Prohibited. Which leads us to make two applications based on what we encounter here and Jesus' handling of the sixth commandment. The first application is this. Unauthorized destruction of God's image bearers is always prohibited. First, it is prohibited as an action of our hands. It's prohibited as an action of our hands. Notice that there's no object of the command. It says, you shall not murder. It doesn't say others. It says, you shall not murder. You must not. You cannot. Which leads many to conclude that the prohibition would include killing oneself. Suicide is a breaking of God's law at this point. We do not have the right to take our own lives. Sadly, you should know this, it is the second leading cause of death among 15 to 30-year-olds in our country right now. 
That was true in 2018 and 2019 and 20 and 21 and 22. Those are the most recent statistics I can get my hands on. A generation has grown up in Ireland, in Limerick. A generation has grown up in our country not knowing who they are or where they come from or why they're here and who they were made for. And so what do they do? They make the logical conclusion of this awful worldview. I may as well not exist. And if you're wondering that this morning, I want you to hear my voice and drive that lie far away from your mind. God made you for himself. You have a purpose, you have dignity, you have worth, you have value. And he shows us his love by sending his son to rescue us. And that can be true of you this morning. But then what happens is into this environment where this tragic reality is the case, as an article in the New York Times put it this week, we have the following, welcome to Canada, your doctor will now kill you. The number of deaths from medically assisted death are the fastest growing in the world in Canada. Seven years after legislation that represents 4% of all deaths, 10 years ahead of government estimates. And we continue to have people who believe that being disqualified for medically assisted death for mental health reasons is a violation of charter rights. Is there any surprise that more take their own lives in the middle when we're offering medically assisted death at the end? And this while at the same time offering no legal protection for the most vulnerable members of our society, the pre-born. Approximately 270 babies will be killed today in our country. Every day. At least those are the ones that we know about. Hospital reporting is mandatory. Clinic reporting is not. Many do, but not all the time. This is where autonomy has gotten us, a culture of death at the beginning, a culture of death in the middle, a culture of death at the end, and at our own hands, no less. In their catechism, How Then Shall We Die?, Ewan Gallagher and Brother Pastor Kyle Hackman, whom I know from the Presbyterian Church in Toronto, they write, this expression of autonomy It recapitulates the basic problem of sin by putting oneself in the place of God, which would justify actions that are self-destructive and harmful. Is this concept of autonomy liberating, they ask? No. It actually brings bondage, they write, for we become slaves to our selfish desires rather than subjects of a higher purpose and good given to us by our Creator. Since we cannot control what we find desirable, we become slaves to our desires and mere creatures of instinct, irrational animals instead of rational ones. And they conclude physician-assisted death, to which I would add suicide and abortion, are paradigmatic examples of this slavery. Any freedom that leads us to self-destruct and hence end our autonomy cannot be true freedom. And such acts are a violation of God's law. And as we take into account the murderous actions of our hands, including the manifestations of that in our country, And in a moment, when we take into account the murderous attitudes of our hearts, including what we still contend with in our indwelling sin, we have to recognize that Paul's assessment is absolutely spot on. In Romans 3, he writes, No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive, the venom of asps is under their lips, 
Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And there needs to be. As we enter into and see news reports and have conversations with people about these life and death issues, it's an on-ramp for gospel conversation to point them to the life and light that Josh reminded us about when we began our service this morning. I'm thrilled for a public worship service to set this forth that there might be a recovery of the fear of God because we've broken his law. Some in this room might be guilty of such things as suicidal thoughts. Some in this room might be guilty of secretly having had an abortion. It happens in the church. Some in this room might have toyed with the notion of taking the out of physician-assisted death. And while it might seem horribly cruel to press in on such areas where suffering is obviously present and guilt no doubt enormous, I do that because there's good news for such folks today. If you're not yet a Christian, you can be forgiven for these ways that you have broken God's law. It is possible For you to come before God, to stand before God without any guilt, without any stain, without any sin, and without any shame. How? Because Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled the law of God as Pastor Sergei prayed. He died in the place of sinners on the cross, and he was raised for our justification. That is raised so that all who trust him could be declared righteous in the sight of God himself. And not only that, but progressively changed to become more and more like Jesus himself. The Bible tells us that for our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what happens when we confess our sin and we, uh, we, we, we uh, say to the Lord God of heaven and earth, I'm a rebel. I was taking matters into my own hands. But when we turn from our sin, when we believe in Christ, when we call upon his name, the Bible tells us that we will be saved, rescued, recreated for the very purpose that God intended us to enjoy himself. And this is not only good news for those who have or have committed murder or who have been tempted to do so in some way, shape, or form. This is good news for every single one of us who have harbored murder in our hearts, which, by the way, is all of us. There's a fascinating chapter in David Powlison's book, Good and Angry. We ask the question, do you have a serious problem with anger? And I want to read to you the whole contents of that chapter of his book. It's one word. Yes. which is where the act of murder begins. Murder as an act of our hands does not begin with the hands, it begins with the heart. And here we need to be confronted with Jesus' right interpretation and application of the law. The sixth commandment prohibits unauthorized destruction of God's image bearers as an attitude of our hearts, not just an action of our hands. Listen again to what he says. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. 
Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liar, liable to the hell of fire. Victor Hamilton writes, and this is the gut punch, Jesus extends the commandment about murder to include attitude, attitudinal and verbal homicide. The heart is where murder is conceived. The heart is where murder is incubated. The heart is where murder is mobilized. And we travel along the path towards murder in all sorts of ways that are in themselves sinful. Murder with the hands is not the beginning of the sin. Murder with the hands is the end of the sin. Murder begins much earlier as it manifests in the heart. Our Lord teaches us that we break the commandment when we chip away at someone's intrinsic value with our words. The cyberbully who tells your son or daughter that they're ugly or fat or dumb or useless or a waste of space and words that I wouldn't repeat are committing, as it were, a form of murder, destroying the value that God has created in them. The parent, the boss, the spouse, the pastor who uses their position combined with their words to twist and distort another's understanding of themselves that doesn't align with God, they are hell-bent on a destructive stripping away of the God-given status and value of that person. The tongue, spiritually speaking, as Jesus taught, is connected to the heart, the center, a control tower of our selves. James writes, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And the trajectory is murderers, which is why such words can cause such deep wounds and why we need truth and light and healing and help to recover from them to replace those lies with the truth of God. Proverbs 12.18 says that reckless words pierce like a sword, which someone says is another way of saying that our words can be used as murder weapons. Over time, their volume can be turned down so they don't control the narrative in our heads that convinces us to believe lies about ourselves. But we need God's voice to interrupt that conversation. The Scriptures speak of other manifestations of murder spilling from our hearts. James writes in James 4, 1 and 2, What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Many a sibling squabble can be explained in light of this teaching. I want to say to parents this morning, please don't just aim at behavior modification. Use the Word of God to mirror back what's going on in the heart when tempers flare and fists fly because someone finished the ice cream or got to the PlayStation controller first. There's murder in there. Gospel need is on display. Their need of Jesus is on display. Gospel transformation is required. Many a marital squabble can be explained in light of this teaching as well. A husband berates his wife after hopes of intimacy were ruined because a kid just threw up. A wife lashes out at her husband because of the unexpected car repair just killed the long-anticipated vacation. This explains the squabbles that exist in the church. Murder lingers in the heart. And when we are shaken, and that's what comes out of us, it isn't because we were shaken. It's because that's what was in there. And when the Lord brings it to light, we need to confess. We need His forgiving grace. We need to ask him to help us murder the murder that's still inside of us, which is only accomplished by the power of the Spirit. And then in another direction, the Apostle John exposes this attitude of our hearts when he writes, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, 
who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Are there brothers and sisters in this room that make your blood boil? Maybe they're in another room. Are there people that you catch yourself daydreaming about taking some kind of vengeance upon? Paying back for some wrong done that you said you forgave or you said you'd be willing to, but in your heart of hearts you nurse a grudge? You see them, you think about them, and the thought rushes in, I hate that guy. I can't stand her. All of a sudden you're across the room and your imagination or across the country and your imagination and you're giving them a piece of your mind or worse, you're taking your pound of flesh. Brothers and sisters, if we incubate that, if we let that grow and then we were to let that loose, it would become murder with the hands nurtured by an attitude of the heart. As Jesus rightly interprets and applies this command and we bring other scripture to bear, it turns out our need for forgiveness is far more expansive than we thought. And our need of transformation is far deeper than we appreciate. Which then ought to throw us over and over as many times as is necessary upon the power of Christ in the midst of our weakness of keeping short accounts with God. Do you understand what that, that saying is? Is that, that when, when these attitudes, we see them rise up in our hearts, we quickly and immediately, with the help of the Spirit who convicts us, we go and we say, Lord, please forgive me. Knowing that his mercies are new every single day knowing that his grace is inexhaustible, which doesn't give us justification to sin, but helps us to know that every single time we do, we can come to him and ask for his forgiveness and help with the many murders that take place many times a day. I need that. And you need that. And there is an abundant supply of grace to forgive and grace to transform. That's who we are in the midst of our sanctification. But here is my hope. My hope is this. Recognizing that the one who received this commandment Remember Moses is up on the mountain and he's going to bring down the tablets of stone and relay this to the people. The hands that he carried those tablets in were hands that murdered an Egyptian. God is a God of grace and redemption and forgiveness and restoration. And he is not only pleased to receive us back to himself through the good news of the gospel, but to use us to bring that hope to others. My hope is this, knowing that the apostle Paul was working the coat check when the first Christian martyr was put to death, looking on with approval, and it helps me recognize, right, God saves sinners. And through Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, they are remade and repurposed. And not only does he use us, my hope is this. He's going to bring us to a place where what was prohibited in the old covenant and what was prohibited in the new covenant will be vanquished and absent forever. There is a day coming when the Lord God says, none shall hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. And so we read Revelation 21.8 with a tremendous 
sense of relief, not initially as a shocking warning to the system. If you're not a Christian, and I hope today you become one, this should be a shock to your system. But these words were written for the church, to those who have trusted Christ, for those who know they deserve to be on the outside, but are only on the inside as a gift of God's grace. Here is the tremendous comfort, and I, I want to help us hear it whenever Revelation 21, 1 through 8 is read. Usually we stop at verse 7. We shouldn't. We should read verse 8, which says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Again, a shock and a warning to those who are not in Christ that you would repent of your sins and trust in him. But if you already have those words are a promise. They're an expectation. There will never be another fall. There's never going to be a repeat of what happened in the Garden of Eden. A day is coming when for eternity future, not another murder will ever be committed. No one will be able to come into the new heavens and new earth to cause anyone harm. And everyone granted entry, having washed their robes in the blood of Jesus Christ. Everyone in the new heavens and the new earth, no one will ever want to commit a murder because they will have been perfected in the image of Christ. And by God's power, may we be helped to press on in light of that upward call. Let me pray and we will sing again. Lord, would you take and use the preaching of your word to build up the church of Jesus Christ. There is a world that is languishing, taking life into their own hands, and we see the tragic results. So embolden us, we pray, to speak truth into the darkest places and into the conversations that we encounter on a weekly basis so that others might see that your law is good, that we have broken it that we need a Savior, that you have given us one, that his name is Jesus, and his name is to be proclaimed, the forgiveness of sins in his name is to be proclaimed to all nations. Give us strength to do this, Lord, we pray, that many would come from the kingdom of darkness and be transplanted into the kingdom of light. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to sing these songs that we will sing now, grateful for the hope of the gospel, so, Lord, I ask that you would help us with all of our strength to sing these truths to one another and to praise you for them because of the hope we have in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.